The keyword static is a very important keyword in C++, and is used a lot. Honestly, because of the very general name, it's probably a bit overused. And largely speaking, it can be used outside and inside of classes. And these two cases are very different. So today we focus on the latter, using static inside of classes. And if you're interested in how and when <clears throat> to not use static outside of classes, then I'm linking that lecture right over here. Now, as opposed to that, static within classes is actually quite useful and is used quite often. If you just want to understand the gist of what static is used for within classes, here is a very concise summary, taken verbatim from cppreference.com. Static members of a class are not associated with the objects of this class. They are independent variables with static storage duration or regular functions. So much so that we can nearly think of them as being normal variables and functions in the namespace that represents the class, with a small additional feature that they respect class access modifiers. If this sounds confusing, don't worry. I, as always, have examples for you that hopefully will clear things up a bit. As you might have already understood, static can be applied to class methods or to class data. Both of these cases are actually quite useful. We'll start with the class methods and talk about the data later, as there are some minor complications with how such data can be declared and defined. To mark a class method static, we just have to add the keyword static at the beginning of its declaration. The definition of such a method, should it be separate from the declaration, remains intact, without the static keyword. So for a class, say foo, we can write two static functions, inline bar, which is defined in place, and bar, which has an out-of-class definition. That could also be in a separate CPP file, of course. To call these functions in a canonical way, we have to prefix their names with the name of the class they belong uh, to, along with the double colon symbol, meaning that our functions can be called as foo double colon inline bar and foo double colon bar, respectively. Essentially, the simplest way to think about static class methods is to think about them as just normal general functions and treat their surrounding class as a sort of a namespace for these functions. This way of thinking is, of course, stretching the concept a bit, but is a useful mental model, in my opinion. To show that these are mostly equivalent to general functions, we can show that we can store a pointer to such a static member function interchangeably with a pointer to a general function. Here we use the ampersand to take the address of each of our functions and store them as a function pointer. It does not really matter here what exactly that type is, as long as it's the same in both cases. If we call these functions through our function pointer variable by dereferencing the pointer first and calling the underlying function with the round brackets, we should be able to call both of our functions, resulting in the output that we expect. And don't worry if this seems a little bit complex. Um, there is no need to fully understand everything here just now. At this point, I just wanted to illustrate that a pointer to a general function and one to a static class method can be stored in the same variable, which means that they are more or less equivalent. Please comment below what you think about it. Did it help? Did it confuse you even more? Let me know. There is one slight difference that makes the static class methods differ from the general functions. The static class methods obey class access modifiers. If we have a static class method in the private region of our class, we can only call it from within the class. That means that from other static or non-static member functions. Note how we don't need to, but still can, explicitly specify which class the private static function is from if we call it from within the class it is declared in. However, if you try to call our private static function from outside of our class, we will get a compilation error that tells us why in a pretty much straightforward fashion. And that's nearly it. Uh, there is one more thing which is slightly confusing, nobody uses it, or at least nobody should, but I still need to tell you about it in case you see it in somebody else's code. Remember how we use the double colon symbol when calling the static member functions? Well, we can also use the dot on an object of a class to do the same. Now, think about it. As we've just learned, the static function has nothing to do with the class object data, and yet it looks like it is called on an object with this syntax. It's kind of confusing, right? I don't know of any situation where this would be useful, but if you do, please tell me in the comments below this video. Now, it's time we talked about static class data. The underlying idea is the same. 
The data is associated to the class type rather than to any particular object of such a class. Technically, on an idea level, this is everything anybody needs to know. What makes this a slightly complicated topic is that the way such data is declared and defined has been changing in the recent years, which adds quite a bit of confusion to the process. The good news is that we are now in a good place. There is an easy-to-use and foolproof best practice for declaring your class static data. Always define your class static data in place by using static inline or static constexpr. Constexpr in this case implies inline. So all of these definitions are basically good to go. We can use static inline for any complex types regardless of the variable being const or not, and we can use static constexpr on any literal type such as an int in this case. If you stick to this rule, your life is going to be much simpler. Seems like it is a good time to ask you to subscribe to my channel if you like what I do. Really, my data shows me that only 20% of people watching these videos are subscribed. It would mean a world to me if you help me out to reach more people. Now, this rule is a lifesaver, but the ones of you who already watched the lecture about using static outside of classes might be very confused now. Just one video ago, I was talking about using inline instead of static, but here I suggest to use both together. So what's going on here? And if you haven't watched that video yet, uh, do so to be just as confused. And as an answer, I need to explicitly state here that the words static, inline, and constexpr mostly mean very different things inside and outside of classes. So do not confuse these cases. To complicate things further, we only got the opportunity to use inline for static class data from C++17 on. Before that, things were much more messy. And guess what? There is still a lot of code that is left from those times. So we'll have to dive headfirst into the mess of static class data out of class definition requirements. Remember how usually data declaration is also its definition? Well, not so for static class data. The declaration of such data is not a definition by default. So we can declare a static variable in a class and define it outside of class, which is called an out-of-class definition. Note how we only use static in the declaration, but not in the definition. Until C++17 introduced inline for use with the data, we had to have an out-of-class definition for every static class variable or constant. With this introduction, we can define them directly during declaration, as we just discussed before. In the remainder of this lecture, we will talk about how things were before inline uh, could be used in such a way, that means before C++17. And here is where it gets more confusing. If we declare a const static class data, we could also provide its definition at the same time. And the confusing part here is that we still needed an out-of-class definition in such a case. If we fail to provide the out-of-class uh, definition, we will get a linker error. Very annoying, and a lot of people, including myself, more times than I'd like to admit, have forgotten this in their code and uh, took some time to figure out why the linker errors pops up. The situation is made worse by only happening sometimes, as it only occurs if foo uh, double colon number is so-called ODR used. Now this term ODR used is quite convoluted, so we will skip the details here, but you might have recognized the ODR part, and that should indicate that it has something to do with ODR or one definition rule, and I went into some details about it in the previous lecture. Long story short, always use inline in modern C++ and you will never have such issues. Okay, I bored you enough with the details like these, let's actually go back to how static can be used in classes, what does it allow us to do? I wouldn't say there is a clearly defined rule here, but let's have a look at a couple of use cases that come to mind. The static class member functions are mostly used for manipulating static class data for creating objects in a special way, in logging or testing libraries, as well as for metaprogramming, which we will probably touch upon later in the course. And just to give a concrete example, uh, we can look at our image class from the image pixelator project that you've hopefully done before. If you haven't done that project, I do urge you to give it a go. There we created an image empty and set its pixels afterwards. Now, what if we wanted to set it to, say, a red color upon creation? Well, we could have a specific constructor that would set the color to the whole matrix, but there is a couple of issues with such an approach. 
the constructor does not introduce a new name, so our intent of how we want to create an object remains to be inferred from the parameters. Such an interface might or might not make sense to you, but in more complex situations it quickly gets out of hands. Furthermore, if we want to do something different while still providing the same parameters, we simply cannot. Uh, this severely limits our capabilities. And finally, sometimes we would like to give such functions that create objects the ability to fail. We could use exceptions for this, stay tuned, but in certain code bases those are forbidden, so we have to have another solution for this. And these reasons nudge us uh, to follow a different path. We could use a static function to create our object instead. A naive implementation of such a function could be a static member function filled with color, for example, that would take the image size and the color we want to set and would create an image inside of it, filling every pixel with the color afterwards. Note also how we uh, can use the private data of our object directly because we are using it from within our class image. And fun fact, there is a version of this function in some of the most used linear algebra and computer vision libraries I am aware of. Eigen has a function constant, OpenCV has a function once, etc. Using these functions usually provides us with uh, convenience and allows uh, to write more readable code that shows intent better. Uh, when we read how these functions are called, uh, we know what happens without the need to see the implementation details. There is a number of situations when such static member functions are useful. Keep your eyes peeled uh, for such situations in the code you read. Oh, and by the way, did you notice something? The uh, ftxui color RGB from an awesome ftxui library is nothing else than a call to a static member function of uh, the ftxui color type. Now, let's talk about static class data. First, let's look at how simple constant static class data can be used. Let's say when we create an image without additional parameters, we would want it to be set to a certain color some default color. While there are many ways about it, we could set a static const member of the class image along the lines of k default color and use it um, when filling our image. This is not uh, that much different from having such a constant at the namespace scope, but as it is only used within the image class, it kind of makes sense uh, to have it stored there. Now on to static class non-const data. This is one of those rare cases when it's okay to use non-const data outside of tight local scope. Uh, we can have static non-const class data that we use to compute anything that must have visibility or that must be used by all instances of this class. This can be a pool of memory or of some stuff modified and reused by the objects of uh, our class or some form of bookkeeping that involves all objects of the class. And just as an illustration, let's see how such data can be used within our image class. Let's say we wanted to know how many image instances are present at any time in our program. We would then extend our class with a static counter. Having this static data is cool and all, but it does not really count the number of objects we have. The way to achieve what we want is, of course, to tap into the way our images get constructed, destructed, copied, and moved. In a simplified way, we would increment our instance counter in any constructor apart from the move one and decrement it in the destructor. Note how we have to implement all of the special functions following the rule of all or nothing. Uh, we had to touch the copy constructor and the destructor, which means that we have to implement the rest of the copy and move constructors and operators. If you're confused about why, we had a lecture about this before, which you can watch by clicking over there. Now we can create an image copy it within some scope, printing the number of instances of image class along the way in various locations. Note how we also use the double colon symbol, just like we did with functions to refer to our class static data. With any luck, we should get the following output. We start with no image objects, create one, copy it to get two, and the copy gets removed, reaching the end of the inner scope to leave us with just one image instance before it too would be destroyed at the end of the main scope. I would say that this pattern is not used very often, but when it is, it is doing important work. We will talk about smart pointers a bit later, and the standard shared pointer that allows sharing the ownership over some data is implemented following conceptually exactly the same ideas. You will also meet these ideas beyond standard C++ library. If you venture into robotics or computer vision, it is only a matter of time till you find yourself using OpenCV. One of the main classes from OpenCV is their matrix class, CVMAT. 
and, you guessed it, it also uses this pattern. Being a bit similar to the standard shared pointer I just mentioned in how it manages the data stored in it. Anyway, hope this example gives you an idea of how such static class data can be used. Please do not hesitate to experiment yourself. As you can see, you can find out a lot already using very simple examples. Overall, as opposed to using static outside of classes, using static inside of classes allows to achieve certain things that are impossible to achieve in any other way. So use it when needed without hesitation. And if you need a single guideline to remember in order to understand in which situation static might be useful for you, remember that it associates data and methods to the class itself, not to any of its instances. So use static class data and functions when they need to work with all objects of your class rather than any single one. That being said, the line between static class data and methods and the freestanding data and functions is quite thin with the differences that mostly come down to encapsulation. Meaning that if your function or data is always going to be related to a single class, put it within that class. Anyway, that's about everything I wanted to say about using static in classes. These videos take a lot of my time. And uh, if you would like to support this work, please subscribe and comment below this video. I'd love to hear from you. Now, if you want to watch when not to use static outside of classes, watch this video. And uh, if you would like to refresh your knowledge on the rule of all or nothing, then click over here instead. Thanks again for watching and see you in the next one. Bye.